this mic. Good afternoon. I am Sylvia Ramos Cruz. I'm speaking today, August 23rd, 2020, sponsored by the Albuquerque Historical Society. As you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic, so we can't really meet uh, in person at the Albuquerque Museum as is usual. So we're here with today on Facebook Live. You will be able to see this presentation later on if you're unable to see it all the way through or want to watch it again later on. I have been researching the suffrage movement in New Mexico for a couple of years. It has been especially hard to tease out facts about suffragists. They didn't write their stories, perhaps didn't even speak about the work they had done. I recently read a four page article about Aurora Lucero's life published in 1960. The article had not a word about suffrage or her role in New Mexico's ratification or about her skills as an orator as a young woman. Researching these suffragists, I have learned, among other things, that these were women of their times, shaped by the world around them. Women who had strongly held beliefs and sometimes just as strongly held prejudices. They were pragmatic women with a single-minded focus on getting the vote. To that end, they sometimes sacrificed principles. I admire about them that they believed in themselves, believed in their ability to bring change that would benefit them, their children, their families, their communities. And I admire about them that they banded together for years, despite political, economic, and social differences to make real the dream they shared. By the time Carrie Chapman Catt arrived at the station in Albuquerque in 1919, she and many other suffragists had crisscrossed this country from east to west for years. In fact, at least 72 years, if we dated back to the 1848 meeting at Seneca Falls in New York. That meeting was called by Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. All men and women are created equal was their declaration of sentiments from that gathering. Along the way, they drew in more and more women, among whom were Susan B. Anthony. She had been arrested for voting without the legal right to vote in 1872. She also had been fined and she never paid that fine. She wrote the 19th Amendment in 1878 and had it introduced in Congress. Alice Paul joined the campaign in 1912 when she returned from studies in England. She was fired up by the work she had done with Emmeline Pankhurst to secure suffrage for the women in England. In fact, Alice Paul was credited by the British news, a British newspaper in 1909 with having invented the hunger strike. By 1920, the movement had 2 million volunteers fanned out across the country. Suffragists traveled on horses, carts, wagons, steam locomotives, automobiles until under all kinds of conditions. When Carrie Chapman Catt arrived at the station on December 3, 1919, she had been on a tour of the Western states since October and she had survived and led her troops through a bout of influenza in the 1918 flu pandemic. How had Carrie Chapman Catt and New Mexico arrived at this moment, the eve of ratification of the 19th Amendment? By 1920, the state's population was over 360,000 people, of whom 83% lived in rural areas and 48.5% were non-English speakers. Among women, Nuevo Mexicanas comprised 
Euro-Americans or Anglos, 37%, Native Americans, 6%, African Americans and Asian Americans, less than 1%. As with any major change in history, a confluence of events leads to that moment. I believe for suffrage, there were five such events or moments, and I will go over each one of them as we travel on this road. Confluence number one, more and more women acknowledged they had the same innate capabilities as men. They were no longer willing to be limited by accepted women's roles. They were the new woman seeking radical change. The suffrage movement in New Mexico grew out of the same sentiments that compelled early suffragists to launch the effort. It grew from women's desire to have their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness acknowledged from women's desire to be recognized as capable of participating equally in the government that ruled their civic lives, capable of tackling needs they saw in their communities in areas such as public education, hygiene, libraries, alcohol abuse, and lynchings. It grew from knowing that their fathers, husbands, and male relatives did not see the world exactly as they did and therefore could, therefore could not and should not speak for them at the ballot box. It grew from a realization that no matter how thoughtfully they had studied the issues or how carefully they proposed an agenda for change, politicians were unwilling to listen to a disenfranchised group. In the end, women had to cast the vote themselves and they set out to win it. Confluence number two, women's clubs, formed as an answer to women's need to participate in a life outside their homes and families. It is true that at the turn of the 20th century, many women were either opposed to or relatively indifferent to their own enfranchisement. The demand for suffrage was most resonant among middle-class women, women from families engaged in the professions, commerce and trade, and educated women who lived in cities and developing suburbs. Farm women and urban immigrant women were less responsive to the call for suffrage and hard to mobilize into collective action. Yet many women around the country were joining women's clubs. It was while I was reading the 50th anniversary booklet of the Albuquerque Women's Club written in 1953 by Maud McPhee Bloom, a suffragist, that I came across a passage that she said explained why all women's clubs in the US formed. It referenced a visit by Charles Dickens to the United States. And it was by serendipity while I was looking for the East Las Vegas women's club named Sorosis that I found the source for Maud McPhee's Bloom story. In March, 1868, an honorary dinner for the author Charles Dickens was held at the all-male New York Press Club. Fanny Fern, a popular New York columnist for the New York Ledger was angered when newspaper women were excluded from the function. She wrote about it in her column. And a month later, the first professional women's club named Sorosis, which means aggregation, was organized by Jane Cunningham Crowley with 12 members. The club grew that year rapidly, and the very next year, all 83 women members of Sorosis were invited to the New York Press Club's annual dinner at Delmonico's. Whether this is indeed the impetus for all women's clubs, it is a humorous and captivating incident. It also showed women how righteous indignation could be used to ignite change that benefited them. In New Mexico, as in the rest of the country, all types of women's clubs proliferated. It was common at that time for many men's organizations, such as veterans clubs, to have ladies auxiliaries to help with ceremonies on special holidays and fundraising social functions. However, in Las Vegas, New Mexico, 
Several women wanted to be more than auxiliaries. They organized their own club, a local chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1885. The first non-temperance women's club in New Mexico may be that chapter of Sorosis founded in East Las Vegas in 1887. Their members convened regularly to present original essays and poems and to distribute their reading assignments. This is the Albuquerque, uh, Albuquerque, probably around the time the Women's Club was founded. And uh, I believe this is the clubhouse. This is Gold Avenue here, uh, looking east. And I think that is the Women's Club there. The Albuquerque Women's Club was founded in 1903 by several ladies for the betterment of women morally and intellectually. They were admirers of Susan B. Anthony, as you can see. They presented a program in honor of her 85th birthday in 1905. That first year, they enrolled 84 charter members of whom had five had Hispanic surnames. One of the women was Mrs. Solomon Luna, wife of a prominent politician and businessman. Later on, members included also Mrs. Octaviano Larrazolo, who was the wife of New Mexico's fourth governor. The Silver City Women's Club began as the Mother's Club in 1909. It is still active and engaged in community outreach programs and projects it helps with scholarships, food drives, school vision and hearing testing programs, among other things. By 1911, when women's clubs consolidated as the New Mexico Federation of Women's Clubs, there were 11. Among them were Women's Improvement Association in Las Cruces, Santa Fe Board of Trade and Library Association, the Lake Arthur Mothers and Teachers Club, the Tularosa Ladies Earnest Working Club, and the lovely ladies of Hobbs who were part of the Federated Colored Women's Clubs. Many were involved in maternalistic issues, infant and child health, child and family health, welfare, public health and safety. Eventually, they would all come to advocate for women's rights while still working on traditional women's activities. Perhaps in this car are members of the Women's Federation of Las Vegas, founded in 1903, or of the Sorosis chapter, uh, founded much earlier. As in the clubs and suffrage organizations nationally, New Mexico club members were mainly Euro-American, middle-class, well-educated, well-connected, influential women married to influential men. In smaller towns, there were more working class women and perhaps more Hispanas. Working for reform through these de facto segregated organizations, club women did not get to know about or have the opportunity to collaborate with Hispanic and other New Mexico women who worked in their own communities for civic reforms through churches, tribal groups, and family associations and club members lost out on the political influence Hispanas had on their male relatives, of whom there were 35 in the Constitutional Convention as delegates. Black women in New Mexico founded their own federation of clubs and sometimes formed friendly alliances with Anglo clubs to work on specific projects. In 1914, the Home Circle Club was founded by Mrs. Lula Black, an educator. She joined eight matrons to better prepare themselves for their duties as mothers and social leaders of the community. Among its agenda items were education for the children, prohibition, suffrage, and lynchings. It was one of the five or six colored women's clubs in Albuquerque. 
other African American women's clubs in communities such as Blackdom near Artesia tackled issues of sovereignty as well as education and town services. This is a photo of the 100 year celebration of the home circle, which is still working to provide scholarships to college students in Albuquerque. It is now all about 106 years old and active and doing well. The third confluence of event was that women realized they couldn't depend on men to enact legislation that advanced their community focused agenda. They joined hands, the, the women's clubs and the suffrage clubs and formed a mass movement. Up to this point, women's organizations had partnered with sympathetic organizations run by men to get their agenda considered by politicians. But eventually that became not really tenable. Thus, as nationally, women in New Mexico joined hands uh, with the clubs, as I said, and the suffrage organizations. And in 1900, the organizations came together uh, as a mass movement for suffrage and a steady march. So in my research, I have found events at all of these points in the march from 1874 to 1921. As I said, it's hard to tease out all of these uh, small amounts of information that gathered from one place or found in another uh, archive. Um, so I would expect that probably the suffrage movement started way before 1874 here. But in any case, that's where I am starting it. There were actually votes for full suffrage rights, full suffrage rights for women in the territorial legislature uh, in 1874 and 1896 they were defeated. I apologize, uh, this mouse is very, uh, very easy to move. So I don't mean to be going back and forth with the slides. Uh, just bear with me, please. So by 1890, the Women's Christian Temperance Union in New Mexico had a department of franchise headed by Ada McPherson Morley. She was a rancher from Dattil who had introduced the idea at one of their meetings. Although much effort went into this, this mission, the main concern for New Mexico women at that time in the 1890s were statehood and prohibition. The Albuquerque Suffrage Club was founded in 1893. And in 1896, the Territorial Equal Suffrage Association was formed. The parents of Maud McPhee Bloom were listed as advocates for the association. Here is Maud and her father, John, and her mother, Mary, and her siblings. There were male suffragists, of course, uh, supporters of women's suffrage, and Mr. H.B. Ferguson, the delegate to the US Congress from New Mexico, the territorial delegate to the US Congress from New Mexico, represented the territory at the National Equal Suffrage Convention in Washington, DC in 1898. One thing that I really probably knew but never really thought much about is that all of these people traveled around the country seemingly quite easily, although I can't imagine going on those uh, heavy iron trains in the heat and, the, and with the smoke and the grime, but they came back and forth um, quite often. In 1899, Carrie Chapman Catt came to New Mexico for the first time to reorganize the association and enroll new members. From that organization came the New Mexico chapter of the National American Women's Suffrage Association which I will call NAUSA. Among its members were Dr. Margaret Cartwright, a prominent Albuquerque physician, who also was the founder of the YWCA in Albuquerque. Ina Sizer Cassidy, who became the first uh, president in New Mexico of the League of Women Voters. Deanne Lindsay, who went on to hold various leadership roles in both 
women's clubs and suffrage organizations were also uh, members of that uh, organization and in the leadership. Despite the work to organize and a membership willing to work for the cause, not much help was given to the New Mexico suffragists by the national organization. Carrie Chapman Cad had realized that it would be almost impossible to amend the New Mexico state constitution. Therefore, her state by state strategy to get suffrage into state constitutions would not work here. The New Mexico constitution had been made deliberately difficult to amend in order to protect the rights of Hispanic New Mexican men to vote, hold office, and sit on juries, even if they were unable to speak, read, or write the English or Spanish language. Nevertheless, despite the lack of support from a national uh, group, the local suffrage work got done. In 1900, this newly formed association sent a letter to both the Republican and Democratic Party conventions asking for suffrage in all matters pertaining to public schools. They stated that women had the principal task of caring for and teaching the young, and that women in Arizona and Oklahoma already had such a vote. And the Las Vegas Daily Optic in 1900 reported, territorial delegate Pedro Perea introduced in Congress a petition this association wrote asking for passage of the amendment to the constitution forbidding disenfranchisement of US citizens based on sex. So this organization was working locally and nationally. And of particular interest to me is that Delegate Perea also submitted to the Committee on Territories in Congress, another one of these associations petitions. It urged Congress not to insert the word male in whatever form of government was enacted for Hawaii, Cuba, Puerto Rico, or any other newly acquired possessions. Puerto Rico had just become a colony of the United States in 1898. So marching along, in 1905, the Santa Fe New Mexican reported that a woman's suffrage bill had appeared in the legislature that very week. About suffrage, a legislator said, women simply do not want it. Whenever they do want it, the male citizens of New Mexico will be gallant enough to give it to them. Well, they did want it, but didn't get it for another 15 years. Solomon Luna was the most powerful Republican at the Territorial Convention in 1910. He was a sheep rancher, banker, Republican National Committee man, and state leader from Valencia County. He supported school suffrage for women and encouraged his niece, Adelina Otero Warren, to work for it. Just before the Constitutional Convention opened, the Women's Christian Temperance Union sponsored a debate in Mountain Air on the question of the ballot for women. That may have been the first time New Mexicans ever argued the issue publicly. Also in 1910, the Albuquerque Women's Club sent a letter asking the Constitutional Convention members to extend the franchise to women on all school questions. Women had realized that full suffrage was not possible, so they had decided to work for it incrementally. They were successful and won the right to vote for school trustees on bond issues and in the local administration of public schools, but not for superintendents. Meanwhile, women were making inroads in their campaign for a greater voice in politics and acceptance of their work outside the home. This snippet of film from the Albuquerque Day Parade in October 1814, most likely at the state fair, shows them in the thick of things. So we see the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and here comes the votes for women. 
car. And it seems like everybody's having a great time. There are no eggs or tomatoes being uh, thrown at the women who are asking for suffrage. And I'll play it again uh, so you can enjoy it one more time, especially since we're not having uh, a fair, uh, a, you know, a state fair this year live. There we go again. The YMCA is represented. The Women's Christian Temperance Union. The Votes for Women float and other people. And it's too bad it's not sharper so we can really see what some of the uh, signs say. In any case, women continue to join the Suffrage Association while also working for suffrage through the various women's clubs. In fact, Deanne Lindsay, chair of the Suffrage Association, was also chair of the legislative department of the New Mexico Federation of Women's Clubs. That October 1914, the women's clubs came out publicly in favor of suffrage. Confluence number four, the bifurcation of strategies, a state versus a national campaign. This bifurcation kept the public's attention on suffrage. Newspaper carried stories about their activities and controversies. Although initially, Carrie Chapman Catt's Women's Suffrage Association and Alice Paul's Congressional Union, or CU, worked together. In 1914, they parted company over different strategy and tactics. Catt founded, uh, sorry, Catt focused on ratification in the states and she was willing to accept partial suffrage. Her members were moderate in their tactics and had the ear of presidents, Congress, and business. The Women's Suffrage Association had a large organization. By the end of the campaign in 1920, they had about 2 million volunteers. Its publishing company had published 50 million pieces of literature in five years. Alice Paul's organization, the CU, focused on Congress as it had to pass the federal amendment before it could go to the states for ratification. A federal amendment, she felt, would set equal qualification for voters in every state. Therefore, individual states would not impose different requirements for voter registration based on racial, socioeconomic, and educational status. So the Congressional Union members lobbied the president and Congress also they held more militant public events that garnered the attention and much sympathy of the public and kept suffrage and suffragists in the news. Still, the Congressional Union needed state suffragists to lobby their congressmen in person when they were in the state and deluged them with letters when they were in DC. The first organizers for the CU came to New Mexico in 1914, and they started to work through the New Mexico Women's Christian Temperance Union. Nationally, the Temperance Union had endorsed women's suffrage in the late 1870s on the grounds that the women needed the vote to protect themselves and their families from alcohol and other vices. A CU organizer attended their temperance convention in July of 1915 and urged women to begin a letter writing campaign asking their senators and representatives in DC to support women's suffrage. Many took up the call, including Ada, including Ada Morley. She had begun writing letters to sway and sometimes castigate politicians as a young woman in Cimarron, and she never stopped. By February 1916, a few months later, Deanne Lindsay, who had also joined the letter writing campaign, wrote to Morley, I think Senator Catron has been stormed and stormed about the suffrage matter. The Santa Fe women have written and written to no avail. In order to access a more powerful base of socially prominent women, the CU shifted its attention from temperance women to club women. 
especially in Santa Fe, and they recruited club women to the suffrage movement uh, through the Federation. By 1915, the CU enjoyed a, committee network, a committed network of support, especially among middle class and elite Anglo club women. Organizers realizing that the majority of the state's women were Hispanas began to reach out to them. Claire Thompson wrote to Alice Paul, they say it is very difficult to get the Spanish ladies out, but as I have one on the program to speak in Spanish, I think they will come out and their husbands as well. Her efforts to reach out to Spanish speaking women paid off, especially among elite women relatives of influential politicians. Nieces of Solomon Luna, including Adelina Otero Warren and Aurora Lucero became active and helped le lead Nuevo Mexicanas into the political mainstream. Bilingual flyers and speeches in Spanish at public rallies brought support for suffrage among both men and women in the Hispanic communities. And because they were bilingual, they reached the rest of the population as well. In 1915, 150 suffragists went on a car caravan to speak with Senators Fall and Catron, who chaired the Senate Select Committee on Women Suffrage, although he was vehemently opposed to women's suffrage. The women made four brief addresses at Catron's home. Lucero, a school teacher in Tucumcari and a skilled orator since grade school, led and gave the political point of view of the Spanish American woman. I speak for the Spanish American woman who while conservative, wants the best possible laws when their home life is the question at issue. I represent the daughters of the conquistadores who first reclaimed this country from the wilderness and all the women of the state. Note the implied dismissal of the indigenous people who were here long before the Spaniards arrived. Tilly Asplund, university and state librarian, spoke about women property owners and uh, spoke about women as property owners and landowners. How unjust it was that they were being taxed without representation a sentiment and cry that goes back to the Revolutionary War. But of course, back then, it was men doing the crying. And all to no avail. As newspapers reported, Catron could not accommodate them, said they are the weaker sex designed to bear children. Men were hardy on the providers. Women would be soiled by politics. Ladies wouldn't vote and only lower class women would. Women had to wait until Catron was defeated in 1916 and Andreas Jones from Las Vegas became Senator. All New Mexico congressmen after that were for suffrage. And as they continued to work, anti-suffrage sentiment and ridicule continued. Everyone works but mother, she's a suffragette. So they began organizing in 1914, the official New Mexico chapter of the Congressional Union for Equal Suffrage formed in 1916. Among its officers were women we've already heard about, Adelina Otero Warren, Julia Aspland, and Mary McPhee. According to John Jensen, the affiliations of some New Mexico suffragists at that time were Congressional Union, 80, NAUSA, 30, Federation of Women's Clubs, 25, Christian Temperance Union, 9. Political party affiliations were Republican, 20, Democrats, 4, and Socialists, 1. Though all suffragists here and nationalists were accused of being Bolshevist at one time or another. And the march continues. In 1917, the conventions of both political parties in New Mexico declared in favor of women's suffrage. There was a meeting in Governor Washington's 
sorry, Governor Washington Lindsay's uh, office at the Capitol, attended by the same men and women who, were, who had worked for this for years. Among them were Senator Barth, Holm Bursum, Charles Springer, Governor and Mrs. Lindsay, and Mrs. Cora Kellum. They strategized on how best to lobby state legislators to get their votes for suffrage. Despite their work, as the Albuquerque Morning Journal reported, suffrage lost by a little. Disappointing, yet hopeful. By that time, Otero Warren enjoyed such a loyal following that she was chosen by Alice Paul to lead the state's branch of the Congressional Union. Her mission was to bombard the New Mexico Congressional Delegation with visits and letters to win their support for the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, and then to get it through the New Mexico legislature. No tiny tasks. The fifth confluence, in my view, is World War I. World War I gave women the opportunity to show that they could do men's work, even while doing their own. They answered the president's call to take over jobs men had left behind when they went for war to war. Suffragists led the war effort nationally through the Women's Committee of the Council on National Defense, and they led it in New Mexico, where Deanne Lindsay was the chair. On Wilson's 1917 call to the nation to conserve food and plant gardens, Isabella Selmes Ferguson of Tyrone, New Mexico, began urging communities throughout New Mexico to plant war gardens in vacant lands. Using conscripted prisoners to supplement volunteer laborers, she converted 140 acres of land owned by the Phelps Dodge Company into a large community garden. She also organized women in southwestern New Mexico to harvest an ocean of corn near Tyrone. It's no wonder that, as the 1917 New Mexico State Blue Book says, New Mexico was thus the first, or maybe almost the first of the states to mobilize its women for war service through an effective statewide organization. Women in New Mexico had had extensive practice organizing and leading in temperance, women's and suffrage organizations for years. In July 1918, Isabel Ferguson was named by Governor Lindsay to head the Women's Land Army for the state. Over 500 women joined. They were paid $2 a day plus room and board. Working conditions were very harsh. 10 hours spent in the fields, sometimes in temperatures that went over 105 degrees. And at the end of the day, sometimes no beds only alfalfa or pine boughs to lie on. Yet much to the delight and sometimes surprise of the farmers, they got the job done. 20 women harvested 30 acres of alfalfa in four days. In another location, eight women moved, raked and stacked 16 tons of hay. And still they smiled, laughed, played and survived. Isabella was a hands-on manager who pitched in to help wherever needed, driving tractors, raking hay, picking fruit. She was a farmerette's farmerette. And she helped nurse some of her volunteers who came down with the flu during the pandemic. By August 1818, pardon me, by August 18, by August 1918, the Silver City Enterprise newspaper announced, Woman's Land Army saves fruit on the Gila. Meanwhile, back in Washington, DC, the militants campaign continued throughout the war and New Mexicans kept track of it. In June, 1917, El Nuevo Mexicano paper reported that White House pickets were attacked by a mob of men over a handwritten flag that said, U.S. has no democracy. 20 million women are denied the vote. Another flag referred to the president as Kaiser Wilson. Men yelled, this is treason, you are traitors, and ripped the flags. 
The differences in philosophy and strategy of NAUSA and the CU groups in New Mexico sometimes erupted as it did over this story. Mrs. Asplund hosted Ann Martin who brought flags that had been at the White House picket. Martin had been arrested, convicted and jailed. The president pardoned her and other suffragists after three days. A big celebration took place at the Santa Fe courthouse. On the same page was the story that Mrs. Lindsay, governor's wife, teacher, and lifelong reformer had sent a letter to President Wilson expressing her and New Mexicans disapproval of these tactics. He wrote back and thanked her. And yet still back in Washington, Alice Paul continued to sew stars onto the National Woman's Party flag as states around the country continued to ratify suffrage, even during the war. And the march continued. In 1918, yet another strategy meeting took place of all the suffrage forces in Albuquerque and Santa Fe. They were coordinating all the time. The meeting was again hosted by Governor and Mrs. Lindsay. And among others, Maud McPhee Bloom was there this time. Aristios Jones from Las Vegas was a teacher who now chaired the influential Senate Committee on Women's Suffrage visited the CU militants jailed in Washington protests, including some who were on hunger strikes. He saw the Susan B. Anthony Amendment out of committee and onto the Senate floor a few times. The House passed it, but the Senate did not. Suffragists continued to petition the president to lend his support. Cora Kellum visited the president and Mrs. Wilson in the White House told him, women in the states are growing restless waiting for this amendment. They are eagerly awaiting action on this issue on the Senate. Won't you help us? The president said, I will, and he did. Two months before the end of the war, President Wilson went to the Capitol to urge senators to vote for it. He stressed the, important of women, the importance of women's work in the war and as they grant women's suffrage as a war measure. We have made partners of women in the war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not to a partnership of privilege and right? Under the leadership of Senator Jones, the Senate voted favorably in June, 1919, 50 years after its introduction in Congress. It was sent to the states NAUSA and CU members immediately began to lobby their state legislatures. By this time, referenda across the country showed support of women's suffrage in three quarters of the state. The amendment went out to the states for ratification. Governor Lara Solo, a supporter of suffrage, had been angered when the legislature failed to pass the amendment in regular session in 1919. He was being bombarded with handwritten notes, typed letters and telegrams from national and local groups and individual citizens. The missives were both for and against suffrage. Among the letters was one from the Farmers National Council whose almost 3,100,000 members supported woman suffrage amendment as necessary to the preservation and extension of democracy in America. Of course, there were letters against it. Uh, the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage also wrote to the, um, to the governor, we appeal to you to come to the rescue of the state right principle. Also in 1919, letters were being sent to the legislature. This one from the Women's uh, Suffrage Association uh, stated that the women had taken on responsibilities and made sacrifices in the war effort. They paid taxes without representation and they still had no say in policies to adjust the cost of living that impacted women the most. 
They went on to say that they saw the post-war reconstruction period as fraught with danger from the advancing wave of Bolshevism and radicalism. Here, they turned the epithets held against them by anti-suffrage forces around. Women's votes would be needed, they said, to help protect the state and the nation. And still, really, 72 years into this movement, what women still wanted was for the long working day, for the taxes we pay, for the laws we obey, we want something to say. In 1919, 20 years after her first trip to New Mexico, Harry Chapman Catt came to Albuquerque to ask for a special session of the legislature. She spoke before large crowds and got ovations at several places. At the Albuquerque Women's Club, she was introduced by Mrs. Felix Vaca, the president. She spoke at the Albuquerque YMCA and at the Albuquerque Rotary Club. And that meeting was the first time since the Rotary Club had been founded in 1916 that women were allowed in its meeting. Rotarians were sold on the justice of having women vote and immediately sent a telegram to the governor. The governor responded by calling for a special session of the legislature to ratify the 19th amendment and amend the state constitution to include women's suffrage. By the time Nina Otero Warren began her last push with Republican leaders to get them behind the amendment in January, 1919, the groundwork had been laid by hundreds of women in New Mexico who had worked tirelessly for this moment for at least 46 years. They had shown their ability to organize and get things done at home, in the community, in factories and farms. Minds had been opened to the idea that indeed all men and women are created equal. Though the campaign had been fought vigorously in New Mexico, to my knowledge, no one here was jailed in a workhouse, force fed, or placed in a psychiatric institution for wanting to vote. No women lost their children when husbands decided wives wanting to exercise their women, their, their why wives wanting to exercise their human right to have a say in what happens to them were not fit wives or mothers. Suffrages had been ridiculed, shunned, manhandled, jailed, force-fed, fired, and divorced, and yet they persisted. Even before the special session convened in uh, February 1920, women's achievements through activism prior to 1920 were being recognized. The Estancia News Herald of January 1920 cataloged their accomplishments, things that women had advocated for and won in the state prior to 1920. They helped raise the age of consent of children from 10 to 14. Husbands could no longer dispose of community property without the consent of the wives. They got school suffrage for women, created juvenile courts, advocated for the provision of care uh, for the care of dependent and neglected children, created child welfare and girls welfare boards, passed the prohibition amendment, and uh, were influential in the formation of the Department of Health in the state. Despite that, as Otero Warren marshaled her forces, anti-suffrage forces, including the Catholic Church, were still working to thwart the effort through allies in the legislature. Representative Dan Padilla of Albuquerque proposed a referendum to let voters decide on suffrage. Well, all the city was up in arms, men's organizations, the YWCA, the Christian Temperance Union, the Women's Committee, the Women's Party, individual men and women until he declared he would vote for immediate ratification, and he did. When time for the final debate came in February 19, 1920, suffragist women packed the Senate galleries. The Senate ratified it. The House balked at passing the amendment, but Otero Warren spent three hours in the Republican caucus, the first time a woman had been allowed into the deliberations. In the end, 
the House ratified the amendment and New Mexico became the 32nd state to ratify. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. However, that ratification was for national elections. For women to vote in state and local elections in New Mexico and run for office other than school boards, the New Mexico Constitution had to be amended. And it was in 1921. It's important to remember that though the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution applies to all women, many groups were not enfranchised and some who were had no access to the ballot box nationally or in New Mexico for many years. That included men also. Native Americans became citizens of the United States in 1924 and therefore able to vote, but in New Mexico could not vote until 1948. In Puerto Rico, uh, women who were citizens since 1917 were unable to vote until 1921, and that was only for educated women. The rest of women, the women had to wait until 1935. The Chinese Exclusion Act prevented uh, Chinese Americans from uh, voting, and that was repealed in 1943. And the Voting Rights Act of 1975 enabled finally uh, Black and, uh, sorry, African American and uh, people of color uh, to vote uh, uh, free from the restrictions that had existed to that point. I don't know if women in New Mexico put these signs on their windows after ratification. Most likely they did. They were very much in tune with the rest of the country. Old Town historian Emma Moya told me that for women in Old Town, voting was very important. An election was a day of celebration. It was very festive. Women who had access to cars would drive around picking up other women to take them to vote. I also don't know whether Soledad Armijo Chavez Chacon whose family lived in Old Town and whose daughter was Emma Moya's teacher, was one of those women who drove the car or was driven to vote. I do know that she was elected New Mexico's first woman secretary of state in 1922. And she served as New Mexico's and the country's first woman governor when she was elected, when she was, sorry, when she acted as chief executive while Governor Hinkle was away from the state for a month in 1924. And this was possible because women across this country fought hard for 72 years to have their voices heard, have a say in what goes on. Democracy begins at home. We must remember that to ensure democracy, we must vote, vote, vote. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias por su atención esta tarde. And I want to thank all the people and organizations who helped me gather the history of New Mexico of suffrage. And now I will turn the screen off and I'll be happy to take questions. Have a good afternoon. Hello? I know this was a lot of material and actually I have tons more material and uh, slides. Uh, this has been a real education for me in uh, 
in how the history of women really has, has not been told because many times women did not tell their own stories. Of note is the fact that the early suffragists, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony did start writing the history of women's suffrage back in almost as soon as they began the movement uh, and continued writing and other people took over the writing when they died, of course, until 1920, when the last volume, volume six came out. I think it came out in 1922. So these women had been recording the history of the suffrage movement throughout all that time. And it's there that I have found many of the names that I, uh, that I mentioned to you today. Of course, uh, it was the history of women's suffrage from their point of view. And Alice Paul didn't really um, sit down to write anything from her own point of view in terms of having that side of the more militant approach uh, to the suffrage uh, campaign. Um, and also we must remember that she who writes the history gets to write it as she wants it to be in a way. So it's important to, uh, to always uh, look at history critically. Yes, there's a question on, did men have any positive role in women's suffrage? Yes, they did. Actually, they did, even from the beginning. As I mentioned in New Mexico, H.B. Ferguson, who was the delegate uh, from the territorial um, government to Washington, D.C., attended the suffrage convention meeting in D.C. early on. Uh, men who supported uh, the women's suffrage are also called suffragists. And here, Here's a note. Uh, in England, uh, the women who work for the vote are called suffragettes. Uh, that term was used derogatorily towards them, but they decided to adopt it. So they were called suffragettes and they're thought to be more militant women who sometimes uh, even resorted to violence. In the United States, we call uh, people who work for suffrage, suffragists. Um, and men and women can be suffragists. So yes, men had a great role. And there, uh, there's a book called Suffragents, Suffragents about many of the men who helped in the movement, especially early on. Thank you for the question. I will also say that a lot of this material comes from the New Mexico State Archives, the New Mexico State Library, the UNM Library and Center for Southwest Research, from the Silver City uh, Museum uh, uh, also. So uh, all of this material is sequestered in different places. And it's been fun driving around to go to these places, but it's, um, it's a real task to try to then um, collect it and put it together uh, so that it makes sense for everyone. Someone has asked me if I will do a book. At some point, I would like to actually. Uh, I'm still in the process of gathering some information on suffragists. There is a woman called Naomi Ruth Stam who is uh, identified as a suffragist uh, in the Albuquerque Museum uh, uh, historical uh, files, and um, and she has some uh, wonderful photographs. And her son wrote a book where he does mention that she worked for temperance and suffrage. And I would think she would be a very interesting person to write about. Also, I just haven't found enough information. So if anybody out there has some, please send it to me. I'll appreciate it. So Nina Otero Warren, someone asked me about. Um, as I said. She was a, a woman uh, who was part of a, a landed, well-to-do political New Mexico family. Uh, she was the eldest of all the children, which eventually came to number 12. So part of the time, she really took over responsibilities uh, for their care. And when one of the, her brothers went to New York to study, she went as a chaperone. And it is there that she worked in the settlement house movement. She may have met Jane Addams there, I don't know. She might even have met uh, Isabella Selmas Ferguson because she also 
did some work in the settlement movement in New York. Um, and then when she came back, she wanted uh, women's suffrage, but was convinced really that the best to, uh, could be done was the, the school suffrage. So she worked for that. But eventually, as you saw, she was a very important woman, a very important person in the, both convincing our delegation in Washington, D.C., and then our local uh, state representatives to make sure that they uh, voted for suffrage because it was the right thing to do. I started, someone asked about when I started it. Um, I started it probably, let's say two years ago, maybe just thinking about it uh, and then uh, gathering information. And initially I was able to go to the libraries and the archives and down to Silver City. And I also visited uh, Dr. John Porter Bloom, who is the son of Maud McPhee Bloom, who is a suffragist. Uh, that I found out about uh, from uh, one of the volumes of the history of women's suffrage um, that as I said, is in six volumes. Her name was there and identified as somebody who had contributed to the suffrage movement. And then uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Bloom, uh, Dr. John Porter Bloom, um, lent me uh, some of the materials from her, um, from her archives and I was able to find out a lot of the information about the Albuquerque Women's Club from that uh, 50th year anniversary booklet. Someone says that none of those names were familiar to me except Nina's and Nat Nino Otero Warrens and Carrie Chapman Cat. I wonder what kids in New Mexico schools get on this. Honestly, I have no idea. I'm not a teacher. Um, but I would dare say very little. I don't know who picks out what history to teach. And it's true, most people don't even know. I was able to gather more than a hundred names of women who were involved in suffrage, whether they were just members of an organization, a suffrage organization and paid dues and did nothing about it, I don't know. But there are over a hundred women who were actively involved. And of course, we know that many people don't join groups. They just go along with a friend to help them out or, you know, in that way, work uh, independently. And so there are many, many women who took uh, part in this movement. Um, so I honestly don't know what the children will learn. Hopefully, they will learn more as time goes on and we unearth more and more of the history of uh, suffrage in New Mexico. When did I say African-American women got the vote? African-American women and all women in the United States theoretically got the vote in 1920 with the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. Um, the problem is, and some of them were able to exercise it from then on. However, as we know, there were, especially in the Southern states, there was a lot of reluctance to allow African-Americans to vote, men and women. So laws were made, the Jim Crow laws, to prevent that from happening. And those laws actually not only affected negatively African-American citizens, but also citizens of Asian-American descent. So um, I would say that African-American women and men and uh, people of color in general were able to vote as of the 1965 uh, Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Thank you for your questions. They are interesting and I am glad you're asking things that I mentioned and, and then things that I didn't mention. Yes, my sash, which as you'll see here, these are the colors the suffragists wore. They were purple, sorry, my, I'm, I'm right to left here. Purple, white, and yellow were the colors of the New Mexico, I'm sorry, of the United States suffragists. The, perp the colors in England were purple, white, and green. Yes, and uh, white, it has been uh, the color that suffragists wore on their marches and parades. As in white for, you know, the purity of their, of their motives in getting the vote, uh, also, uh, white uh, shining light on the day, perhaps. Uh, 
so uh, yeah, these are the colors. I'm not wearing the hat, uh, but uh, I'm wearing these colors. Is there more information about what was happening in Las Cruces? Yes, there is. And I'm sure the New Mexico State University has an archive there of uh, women's organizations. So the, uh, the Women's Club in Las Cruces, about which uh, I had a slide which somehow I passed over uh, that showed a page from the Albuquerque uh, Women's Club 50th anniversary booklet. And that, uh, and that page showed Maud McPhee Bloom's annotation about the fact that that Women's Improvement Association in Las Cruces, which was an early women's club, Maud said had been formed at a meeting in her house when they were living in Las Cruces before they moved to Santa Fe. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of, there's a lot of history to unearth. And uh, you know, anybody out there who's interested just start looking because if you look, and especially these days, so many records and archives are online. First of, co of course, you have to figure out how to do the online and where to search and what to click on. But once you do that, having that access to the archives is really very helpful and has been immensely helpful during this pandemic. I have been able to continue looking into these areas uh, all through this time. Uh, Cora, uh, Cora Armstrong Kellum, uh, the suffrage uh, leader, actually she was a suffrage leader uh, in New Mexico, who I said had gone to uh, Washington DC and met with President and Mrs. Wilson. After 1920, she joined forces with Alice Paul again to promote the Equal Rights Amendment. As you know, Alice Paul wrote the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923 because she understood that women's rights were not guaranteed by just having the right to vote. They needed to be explicitly guaranteed in the constitution and modeled that amendment after the vote amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment says, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That was in 1923. And this is 2020, 97 years later, we're still working for it. Now we have 38 states that have ratified it. And, uh, and we're waiting for the archivist of the United States to accept that last ratification by Virginia, which just happened this January 19, uh, 2020, to accept that ratification into the United States archives for it to become uh, proclaimed as the amendment. Uh, we're uh, battling in the courts to have him do that. Um, it's not clear why he hasn't done that. He did accept the other two ratifications that occurred in Nevada in 2017 and in Illinois in 2018. So we're hoping that will happen soon. Well, I think we're well over our time. I thank you all for your attention, attending your questions, your very nice comments. And I hope you will feel uh, energized and interested enough to go look into the women's suffrage movement in New Mexico. Have a good day.